Check, check, check. All right. We're going to get going here in just a few minutes. We apologize for the delay this morning. Uh, uh, we've been working on a couple of uh, uh, issues. Uh, we think we've got them all figured out. Um, we're going to be running out your lyric sheets here in just about two seconds uh, uh, so that you have uh, lyrics to the songs. Uh, but real quick, a couple of announcements. Uh, um, here in just a couple of weeks, uh, we are going to start doing some indoor services as well. So we are going to continue doing this 8.30 outdoor service uh, for everyone who's been enjoying this outdoor uh, parking lot service. We are going to continue doing that. But starting on uh, July 12th, uh, we're going to be doing uh, a couple indoor services. Uh, those services will be at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, so we'll have the 8.30 outside, and then we're going to actually have two separate 10 o'clock services inside. We'll have one over there in the chapel, and then we'll have one over here in the auditorium. Um, the inside services, we do have a bunch of restrictions, and we'll get all that information out to you. Um, one of the big things that we're going to be doing is you're going to need to RSVP for those services because we're limited to the amount of people that can be in those services. And so uh, this next week, uh, you should be receiving a letter and some more information about how to RSVP for those services. Uh, again, they'll be at 10 o'clock starting on June 12th. Uh, over uh, one one service in our chapel, another service in the auditorium. So that's that's good news. So you have four options starting on the twelfth. We'll still have the online option. You got the eight thirty outside option. Then you have two indoor options. Make sense? All right. Um, one other announcement uh, on Friday we had to uh, postpone our um, we had to postpone our movie night uh, due to weather. Um, and we actually had a power outage here at the church, so it was a good thing that we uh, we postponed it because we wouldn't have had power anyway. So um, we are going to do that on the 10th of July. So Friday the 10th of July, we're going to be watching Onward uh, right here in the parking lot. So uh, be sure to join us for that. Uh, we're going to get our service going here in about two minutes. Um, so thank you guys for being here. Oh, we have a car that's running. Uh, if you have a black Honda back over here, your car might still be running. If you moved your, uh, maybe you moved your chair forward. But uh, if you have a black Honda kind of back in this area, your car is actually running. So you might want to. Okay, we just shut it off. It's good now. <laughs> All right. We'll get going here in just a minute.
All right, good morning, everyone. So, everything is broken. Uh, we are having some technical issues. Uh, we are not going to have the lyric sheets for you, but I can do you one better. Uh, if you just want to like pull out your smartphones, if you just want to Google the lyrics, honestly, Google the name of the song, the lyrics will pull up, you can have them on your phone, or if you prefer to just sit and listen, that's cool too. Uh, we're going to be singing three songs this morning. The names of the songs are How He Loves, How Majestic, and Joy To Be. So if you just Google those three songs and you want to pull up the lyrics and sing along, you can. Or if you know those songs, you know some of these are going to be favorites that you guys probably know and you can just sing along. Uh, again, we apologize. There are some issues happening inside and our printer is just not behaving. So the songs we're singing are How Majestic, How He Loves, and Joy To Be. So if you want to Google those and pull them up, you are more than welcome to. Or uh, if you just want to close your eyes and listen, that will be totally acceptable this week. So let's, uh, let's start worshiping this morning.
is a soul. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us. Taste and see all he's done. Heaven to earth has come. Fathers shout the victor's cry. Brothers feast upon his life. Joy has dawned. Death has been overthrown. Mercy is on its throne. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Sinners, come behold your King. So rise with hope and sing all is well mercies are new this day burdens are met with grace oh lord our lord how majestic is your name in all all secure all hopeful and all broken all thankless and all poor all peaceful and all violent all fear all afraid, all angry, all rejoicing, all doubting, all assured, all joyful and receive his love and mercy his grace declares his glory you are loved forever holy oh lord our lord how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
sorry about that. I can't count past three. Two, I guess, was. Well, for those of you who uh, are not sure who I am, I'm Kim Garut. I'm one of your servant elders. And uh, just the other morning, I realized something as I was looking in the mirror. I've seen that face before. And uh, Linda said, well, isn't that Santa Claus? No, no, no. It's uh, one of those garden gnomes. I've seen them before. All I need is a little top hat there, and I'd just be right on the money. Uh, let me uh, begin our communion service now with a brief scripture reading. Uh, today's scripture comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Perhaps you know these words. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Uh, it's a good time for us to share in the communion, and we want to approach this time uh, with the right attitude and with the right uh, mindset. If anyone does not have their communion elements, uh, maybe we have time to get them to you. Raise a hand. Uh, we'll do our best to get those to you. Um, there's an old hymn I found in one of the hymnals I have in my office uh, that talks about the attitude of surrender. All to Jesus I surrender. Many of you know these words, right? All to him I freely give. I will ever trust and love him. In his presence daily live. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. And then again, Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. This is the kind of attitude that gives honor to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit recognizing the great sacrifice that was made to bear my sins and yours too. Jesus had to die in order for us to live and abide in God. Only in the name of Jesus Christ is there forgiveness of sins and salvation. And for that, we are thankful. Here at Northland Christian Church, we share the Lord's Supper each Sunday as an honored part of our worship. We do this because Jesus himself instructed us to remember him in this way. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he himself invites you to join us in the Lord's Supper. We know that God is here with us. So let us take a moment for each of the emblems to give thanks to God, to pray, and to remember Jesus. The bread is taken to remind us of Christ's body, which was surrendered for us at the cross. Likewise, the juice is given to remind us that our salvation is paid for by his shed blood. Please join me in some scripture reading and prayer. The Apostle Paul writing in, uh, recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, he said this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you will now, please join me in a simple prayer. Thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ, who gave his life as ransom for me. I do this in remembrance of him. Before we partake of the juice, I continue with the apostles' instructions in verses 25 and 26, where he writes, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread 
and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Once again, I invite you to join me in a simple prayer. Thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ and for the blood of the new covenant. I do this in remembrance of him. May the peace of Christ be with you today. This next song we're going to sing, uh, in case you want to look at the lyrics again, is called Joy to Be. Joy. 
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're continuing uh, the series uh, that we're, we're, uh, we're calling Simple Prayers. Uh, these are prayers that, that all of us ought to be saying all of the time. So that, that it is all of us. That means you. That means me. We should be praying these all of the time. Uh, I know when life gets uh, confusing and life gets chaotic, sometimes we don't know what to pray. Uh, do you remember that verse? It's, it, it's in the book of uh, it's in the in the book of Romans in chapter eight, and it's talking about those moments where where you've been praying and 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 you pray to the point where you you no longer have anything that that you can even say. In fact, it's, it says it just comes out like a groan. And it says that the Spirit fills in and the Spirit prays for you. Uh, I think that's a beautiful thing. But even in those moments, when you don't know what to pray, you can pray these simple prayers. Because these prayers are for all of us, all the time. I find it interesting in Luke chapter 11. I will read this verse. This is the first verse there in Luke chapter 11. <coughs> it says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. I just want you to think about that for a little bit. Think about all the things that they've witnessed, all the things that Jesus had done that you would want to learn from him. Of all those things at their disposal, you know, walking on water, feeding the multitudes with a, with a little boy's sack lunch. Healing the lepers, giving sight to the blind, raising the dead back to life. Of all the things they could have asked about, isn't it interesting that this is what they asked about? They said, Lord, teach us to pray. See, I think that these men that followed Jesus, the men that were closest to Jesus, knew that there was some power in, in prayer. They knew that, that all those other things had everything to do with Jesus' close and intimate relationship with the Father. And so they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus gave them this, this simple prayer. He says, Father, or he says, pray like this, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive our sins as we also forgive everyone who has sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation. What a simple prayer for when life gets confusing and, and chaotic. Pray, hey, God, God, you're good. You're so good and you're holy and you're creator. And even though I, I can't, I don't know what's going on, I know that you know what's going on and you're in control. And so I honor your name. I honor your name through my life. I honor your name through my words. And so, Father, my prayer is that your kingdom would come. Just rain down your kingdom into this place. Rain it down through me. Rain it down through your church. May your kingdom come. And, God, everything I have, everything I am is, is, is in you. And so, Father, sustain me. Father, provide for my most basic of needs which are two things, daily bread, daily bread and forgiveness. God, if you would just give me those two things, that's all I need. Just a little bit of food for my belly and food for my soul. And he closes with these words. He says, and lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Uh, that's going to be our theme for today is, is this idea of, of, of temptation Another way to pray this would be to say, Father, protect me. Protect me from the dark world around me. Uh, protect me uh, from others. Protect me from that draw or that pull towards sin in my life. Protect me from myself. What a simple prayer that we all should pray all the time. Lead us not into temptation. In fact, uh, Jesus is going to stress this point again at the end of this book. Uh, if you flip over to Luke chapter 22, uh, they are in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is Jesus' last night here on earth. Uh, in just a few hours, uh, he is going to be arrested and tried and crucified. Just imagine the heaviness in the air that night. 
And we read in Luke chapter 2 uh, that the disciples, they really didn't know what to do in a situation like that. Uh, it was confusing and chaotic, and they didn't know what to do. And so they looked towards Jesus and said, what, what, what should we do? And Jesus says this to them. He says, get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. That's what he says in that darkest moment. He says, get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. In fact, he says it twice in this little passage because what Jesus knows is that in just a few hours, they are going to be tested. Their faith is going to be tested. Uh, their walk is going to be tested. Everything that they knew or they thought they knew about Jesus was going to be tested. And the test was simple. The test was this. Either you will stand by my side or you will run for your life. That's the test. And we know what happens, don't we? Almost all of them ran for their lives. And so Jesus' instruction to get up and pray so that you may not fall into temptation is such an important prayer for us to hear. Because here's, here's the truth. Prayer is a part of the preparation when it comes to temptation. I'm going to say that again. Prayer is a part of the preparation uh, when it comes to temptation. I think that oftentimes we pray way too late in our, in our battle with sin. We pray, we pray when we're trapped. We, we, we pray uh, when we're already hooked. But Jesus says, pray now. He says, get up right where you're at and go and pray so that you might not fall into temptation. A prayer against temptation must be a daily prayer, and it must be about preparation, and then it's all about action. So we pray, God, lead us not into temptation, and then we got to follow him where he's leading us. Because let's be honest, we all have a garden, don't we? We all have a garden just like Gethsemane. All of us have a place where the temptation is thick, where, where maybe our resolve is, is weak and our faith might be tested. And so my question for you right now is, is where are you being tempted the most in your life right now? I mean, if, if we're going to meet like this, let's just get real with each other. So I want you to think about that question right now. Where in your life are you being tempted the most right now? It might be in a relationship. It might have something to do with maybe getting revenge or getting even. Or maybe that you're just stuck in unforgiveness or resentment. Maybe it's all about getting ahead and, and you're tempted to take a shortcut. Or to cheat others or to, or to pull others down so that you can get ahead in life. Maybe it has to do uh, with, with uh, uh, an addiction A vice, the things that you let your eyes see or your ears take in. I want you to name your temptation as we listen to his promises. Here's, here's God's promise to us when it comes to temptation. We can read it there in 1 Corinthians 10. It says, no temptation has overtaken you. Uh, some other translations uh, use the word seized you. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Did you hear that? You're not the only one. That's what that means. You're not the only one that's going through that. There are other people that are being tempted in the same way. In fact, Jesus himself was tempted in many of the same ways that you are tempted. And you're not alone in your temptation. And he says this. He says, and God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Did you hear that promise? He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And then he says this. He says, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you may endure it. What a beautiful promise to us. No temptation will seize you. No temptation will overtake you uh, except what is common. And God is faithful and he's true and he's present with you in your temptation. And he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but he's always providing a way out. He's always providing a way that you can conquer it. And sometimes the way out is before you've stepped onto the path. Jesus says, pray, get up and pray so that you 
may not fall into temptation. Sometimes our best battle with temptation is right at the beginning. Father, lead us not into temptation. I want to be very clear here. Temptation is not a sin, all right? Temptation is not a sin. Sometimes I'll feel guilty just by being tempted. Temptation is not a sin. Acting on it is a sin. Jesus was tempted, but Jesus was sinless, wasn't he? So temptation is not the sin. Temptation is not what you need to feel guilty about. It's when we act on it. It, It's when we uh, 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 allow the cycle of sin to take root in our life. And so what I want to do for you today is I want to, we're going to go through the cycle of sin. I'm going to give you four things, the cycle of how sin works, and I'm going to give you four things for how to conquer the cycle, okay? We're going to keep this super simple. You can, uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to James uh, chapter uh, 1. Uh, in verse 13 and 14, uh, he gives us, 13 through 15, he gives us the cycle of sin and how it works. This is what he says. He says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. Have you ever done that? It'd be easy to say no, but I'm very quick to point the finger at God when life isn't going, right? He says, when tempted, uh, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But then he says this, he says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Did you hear the cycle there? Here's how the cycle of sin works. It begins with desire. It begins with the sin nature that's inside of you. It begins with desire. And again, it's easy to blame others for that. It's easy uh, to blame God for that. But that, that sin nature comes from inside of you. James says uh, your, 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 uh, your leading towards sin isn't because of, of external circumstance or external pressures. Your desire for sin comes from internal desires. And that's where it begins is these internal desires catch your eye. And so the next part of the cycle is that, that once that desire ca- catches your eye, it turns or it gives birth to deception. So it goes from desire to deception. The word that uh, James uses is that, that it begins to entice you. That desire turns into something uh, uh, so much worse because it, it, it turns into something that entices you. It, it seduces you. The bait has been set, and you're circling, and you're being lured in. See, that's the way it works. It begins with desire. And then we start to entertain that desire. And the more that we think about the desire or the more that we, we, we entertain the desire, the more that we start to justify it, the more that we start to make excuses. Oh, you know, it's just one time. It's just one time. Oh, you know what? It's, I'm not going to hurt anyone else. Uh, this sin is just me, you know. It's, 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 in, it's in private. Nobody will even know. I'm not hurting anyone else. Maybe the deception goes like this, you know, maybe the deception says, you know what, I deserve it. I do the right thing all the time, and I deserve this one opportunity to put me first. I've earned it. I deserve it. And you are enticed, and you are deceived, and and that leads to disobedience. It leads to disobedience. We take the hook, don't we? We take the hook... And we're trapped. A couple of weekends or a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, my family went camping, and uh, while on our camping trip, uh, we decided to go fishing. Uh, fishing is something that I haven't done very much since I was a kid. And let me just say this: I am not a good fisherman. You would think, with the name Troutman, that I might be a decent fisherman, right? I am not a good fisherman. In fact, everyone caught fish while we were up there, including my, uh, my uh, four-year-old niece caught a couple fish. Uh, I was the only one that caught absolutely zero fish. I caught no fish. I, I'm not a good fisherman. And here's why. I am not a patient fisherman. I'm not patient at all. I, I throw my line out there, and the moment that it starts to move, I jerk back on it and try to reel it in. 
That's not what good fishermen do, is it? Good fishermen are patient. What they do is they let the fish kind of circle and kind of nibble. And then they circle a little bit more and they get a little, little more taste. And eventually they begin to feel safe around the worm. And they think, you know what, there's no threat here. And eventually what they do is they, they, they take one big bite and they swallow the hook. See, that's the way sin works. It begins with desire. And then you start to deceive yourself that, hey, it's safe around here. You know, I won't get caught. Nobody will know. It's just one time. Nibble, nibble, nibble. Until you grab the hook. And the hook is set through disobedience, through sin. And here's what James says. He says that disobedience leads to death. Because you're hooked and you're trapped. And now you're not in control. No matter how hard you fight against the hook, he's reeling you in. That's the cycle of sin. And so the question for us this morning is how do we combat that? So I'm going to give you four tools to combat it. These are all super simple. In fact, I think you can already guess the first one. What do you guys think the first one is? Say it out loud. Pray, right? The first thing you need to do before you're even tempted, you need to pray. Jesus says, get up and pray so that you might not sin, so that you might not uh, take the bait. Pray early. Pray often. Pray unceasingly. Pray. Pray prayers like this, like the prayer found in Psalm 139 that says, search me, God. Search me. Search my heart. Know my heart. Test me and know all of my thoughts. Pray the prayer that says, God, if you see that there's anything offensive in me, would you just lead me in the way everlasting? Pray prayers like that. Because here's what I know. If the first step in the cycle of sin is desire, the closer you are to God, the less things that you desire that you shouldn't be desiring. If we would just be drawn in to God and His presence and in, in, in His way, all those things that seem desirable, that seem like we want it, all of a sudden they're no longer desirable, are they? So begin with prayer constantly withdraw and pray if we look at the life of jesus that's what he's doing he's constantly withdrawing and praying to god here's number two number two is know god's word know god's word memorize god's word uh, allow his word to take hold of your life do you remember when jesus was led out into the desert to pray or and and he prays and then at the end of that time satan comes and begins to tempt him. Do you remember how Jesus responded to every single temptation? His response started with three words every single time. It is written. When tempted in the desert, Jesus went to Scripture, and he remembered the Scriptures that he had memorized, the Scripture that, that God had laid on his heart. He said, I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to fall for your tricks, Satan, because it is written that I should not do this. So know God's word. Memorize God's word. And the, the more you know it, the, the less you'll be tempted. Uh, but also know this, Satan likes to use God's scripture sometimes to try to lure you in. Remember what he did with Eve in the garden? He twisted God's word and tried to lure her in. Know God's word. Here's number three. Envision the consequence. Envision the consequence. I think if we would do this, this is one thing. We'd sin a whole lot less in our life. If you would just take a moment and stop and actually think about what the consequence is, what the trade-off is for you uh, and that sin, what the costs are, not just for you, but for the people around you, for your family, if you would just think about the cost of the sin, the remorse and the regret, the guilt and the loss of trust, 
If we would just take a moment to pause and stop and think about it, we wouldn't take the bait. I mean, just think about that. Let's go back to the fishing story. If you, if you knew that there was a hook there, and you had stopped and thought about the consequences of swallowing that hook, would any fish ever swallow the hook? No. But that's the way sin works. Stop and think about the consequence. Stop and, and think about what might happen if, if you do get caught. Or even if it's not that you get caught, it's that you get in this cycle of sin and you get, uh, this becomes not a one-time thing, but it, it happens over and over and over and it multiplies and it magnifies. Stop and think about the consequence of your sin. This is the way Solomon uh, describes sin. If you, if you want to know the consequence of your sin, this is the way uh, uh, Solomon describes it in Proverbs 7, 21 through 23. He says, with persuasive words, she, this is sin, with persuasive words, she led him astray. She just uh, seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into the noose, till an arrow pierced his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. Desire leads to deception, which leads to disobedience, which leads to what? Death. And whether that is spiritual death or physical death, that is the result of sin. Here's number four. Here's number four. Run away. <laughs> Run away. When you are faced with sin, don't flirt with it. Don't sit there and examine it. Don't justify it. Don't make excuses. Run away. Run away. It's that simple. In fact, uh, you could even uh, uh, pray about it, and, and, and uh, God will do you one, one better. He'll make Satan run away. He says in James 4, he says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Don't flirt with it. Run away. Church, I'm glad that you gathered with us here this morning. Uh, here's what I know I know that all of us, uh, on a daily basis, we struggle with temptation. And God is calling us uh, to the best lives, the lives that are lived uh, within his uh, uh, glory and within his presence. And a big part of that is to walk with him and resist the devil, resist the enemy. And so as you go from this place, pray. Know God's word. Envision the consequences. And run away. Will you pray with me? Father God, you are so good. We thank you for who you are and how you work in our lives. God, we know that uh, we can't battle this alone. Uh, the draw to sin, the sin nature that's inside of us is far too great for us to battle alone. And so we thank you for your presence and your power and your Holy Spirit that help us to conquer sin in our lives. Father, lead us not in temptation. We, do, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, you guys, have, A lot of you guys have been here before. Uh, uh, kind of come in the same way that you went out. Uh, feel free to hang out. we got a little cloud cover here. Feel free to hang out and fellowship as much as you'd like. Uh, we are glad that you're here. Um, we'll see you next week at 830 for outdoor service, and then the following week is when we'll start some indoor services. Uh, thank you for being here.